Welcome to the Art of Procurement Podcast with your host, Philip Eidson. Here, thought leaders share the trends, strategies, and tactics that you can use to elevate the role of procurement and your career. Hi, there, everybody, and welcome to episode 22 of the Art of Procurement Show. It seems uh, like it's only been five minutes since I first recorded uh, the very first episode of Art of Procurement. And uh, i got to be honest, that was done with some trepidation. Um, I can't believe that we're here at 22 already. You know, I'm really, truly thankful for listening to the show. I continue to be really motivated by the momentum that we're building. And uh, it's just incredible when I see the numbers and, and, you know, kind of the reach of the show. It's just fantastic. If you do find value in the show... What I'd just really love is if you could just tell a few colleagues, you know, point them in our direction and help spread the word. So I'm really chuffed, as they say back home in England, to welcome today's guest on the show, who is Gerard Chick. So I go into Gerard's background a little bit more detail as we go into the discussion. But, um, you know, simply Gerard is the epitome of a procurement thought leader. He's worked across public and private fields. He was the longtime head of research and knowledge management at the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, so SIPS. And he recently became the recipient of the Best Procurement Book Award of 2015 in a ceremony in Paris uh, back in December. Gerard is a truly a prolific writer about procurement and the trends that will shape the future of our profession. If you haven't yet come across his work then honestly, I think you're in for a real treat as you discover him and his work. The focus of our conversation today was to discuss the behaviours, habits and attributes that make procurement professionals and particular leaders effective in their job. You know, one of the areas that I was really particularly interested in was the need for procurement to align with the vision and the needs of the rest of the business as opposed to operating in a silo. And that's something that we, uh, we talked about among a number of different subjects in, in quite a great detail. So check that out as you listen to the show. Before I do go into the show, I want to remind you that if you haven't already done so, you can download my uh, free report called The 21 Tips to Help You Secure Your Dream Procurement Job. So the report is a summary of tips and tricks that cover the entire job search process. And it's compiled from Art of Procurement Interviews, if you uh, would like to get hot, your hands on a copy of the report, it's at artofprocurement.com slash 21 tips. That's artofprocurement.com slash 21 tips. Okay, well, with that all being said, let's roll the tape. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world today. Uh, thanks for tuning in to the Art of Procurement show. So as I mentioned before the music rolled, I've really been looking forward to this show for a long time. Uh, my guest is Gerard Chick. Now, Gerard is the Chief Knowledge Officer for Optimum Procurement, and Optimum Procurement is a leading procurement outsourcing and consulting firm. Prior to his role at Optimum, Gerard was the head of research and knowledge management for SIPS, um, SIPS being the Chartered Institute of Purchasing Supply. And for listeners, mostly in the US really, that are unfamiliar with SIPS, they're the largest procurement organization, uh, professional procurement organization in the world, and they have over 100,000 members worldwide. Gerard is also one of the true thought leaders in our profession. That was one of the reasons I'm really excited to talk uh, to Gerard today. So in December 2014, he co-authored the Procurement Value Proposition, The Risk of Supply Management, with uh, Professor Robert Hanfield, who's the Bank of America Distinguished Professor of Supply Chain Management at North Carolina State. The book recently won a, a really prestigious literary award, and um, Jared and, and Robert became the first non-French winners of the Plumes de Chats. Procurement Authors Award. So, Gerard, with all that as an introduction, and there's a lot of an introduction there, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. It's nice to, to be on the show. So that's quite some background. Um, have you always been in procurement, or did you come into the profession kind of later in your career? Did you stumble into it? Um, I got more into the, the thinking about it and, and looking at how we might do it better uh, later in my career. I mean, uh, after I left college, uh, I worked for the UK Ministry of Defence for a while in defence procurement and defence procurement, uh, where I was buying stuff, but also I moved into a job there where I was looking at uh, defence procurement policy. Um, 
And then I did sort of various things around about the place. I worked in uh, a financial services company for a while. I worked in um, higher education. But the higher education stuff was, it was largely, it was sort of contract based, but it was research contract based. Okay. So I was looking, I was working in universities, or well, in a university at first, at uh, kind of doing general work and, and get trying to develop a grant profile for them. And then I went to work for a, um, uh, a medical school, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, which is a pretty prestigious place in the UK. Right. Um, and where I was in charge of um, the sort of... Um, they called it sort of research services. So I helped academics get money, worked with them, helped them to monitor spend, spending it and mm-hmm. uh, develop their portfolios, that kind of stuff, which was interesting work. And then I moved into SIPs, where I started to look more deeply into procurement and, and how we do it. And how did you come to join SIPs then? I've always wondered, if is it an organization that recruits or is it um, uh, voted on? You know, are you, do you get elected to SIPs? No, you, you have to. <laughs> I had to apply for a job and go for an interview. And uh, um, they, what they wanted to do at the time that I joined them was they wanted to start, and it was a, sm- a very smart move, I think. So they wanted to start to develop um, a knowledge management function in the organisation. So they wanted to look at and understand what they had, what we might need, who we might, might need to speak to, um, and sort of develop. A, a repository of knowledge, which isn't like a sort of uh, a room full of knowledge or uh, computers full of knowledge. What it was was a big part of it was networking. It was getting in touch with people who knew stuff and staying in touch with them and being in touch with them in a way that they were prepared to share stuff. So some of the things were linking with academics, um, and that was not just in the UK internationally. I did a lot of work with ISM in the States. Uh, and uh, with a good friend of mine um, at NIGP. Um, I also was involved with academics in procurement in Europe, Australia, and the Far East. But it was it, the important part of the knowledge management aspect was, was it was like relationship management, really, a bit like SRM, I suppose. Mm-hmm. These people who could supply us with knowledge and thinking and, and, and practical guidance – uh, felt comfortable and with, enough with us to share it uh, and to contribute. And, um, you know, there were some pioneering people from the UK, um, but there were also people from, from overseas who, who kind of added to it. I think that's where the strength of SIPs comes from, uh, because it has such um, a broad network. Right. Um, and maybe it's a loaded question, given that you were involved in the setting up of uh, the knowledge repository at SIPs, but I'm interested in your thoughts on the role of education in procurement and kind of continuing education. Is it enough for a professional to learn on the job and try and open themselves to as diverse a set of experiences as possible? Or should they really be looking at broader, more formal education, Um, whether it be through the more general route of an MBA or more formal procurement specific education? That's an interesting question. I was at an event in London yesterday where we talked um, about this very thing. Um, I think that as we move forward in procurement, but probably in business generally, there's a, la- a large aspect, or, or to me a, a, a big aspect of, of how we are today, is that lifelong learning really matters. If you look at other professions, like certainly like people who practice the law, um, medicine and other areas, um, practitioners do get the hands-on um, uh, kind of experience, but then I think validation comes from the rigor that academe brings. Mm-hmm. So I think that, um, yeah, it's important to learn the basics because the basics, the principles, the things that have come to the fore, uh, and I think the United States was, was um, the, con- the country that kind of got under the skin of this at first because um, SIPs came about as a consequence of... Uh, a guy called Swinbank going over to Chicago in 1929 and licensing a sort of professional procurement yeah. qualification. Interesting. And bringing it back to the UK. In fact, I think he took it back to the county you're from. I think it started off in Yorkshire. The be- best county in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, um, America in many ways had, was a step ahead because they understood 
uh, people like Carnegie, people like mm -hmm. um, Taylor, people like Ford, they understood, and Kellogg understood that you needed to, to, to get people thinking about business issues and develop business models. But those things have changed. So I think that there's a mixture required. You do need to come with the basics, not just literacy, numeracy, right. etc. You need to come with some technical skills. But the real training, uh, I think, comes after that. And, and interestingly, I, I had a, a conversation, brief conversation with a guy who works in the States. He's an ex-Navy SEAL. His name's Jeff Boss. And Jeff does a lot of work on behavior and, and, and adaptation. And I think we, the, the lines that we were both thinking along is that if in the new volatile business world, and the business world now is volatile, the way that they look for people in the services to go and work in an, in an environment where they need to adapt, they need to be resilient, they need to be able to communicate, to commune with other people, um, you know, yeah, they're soft skills. And yes, these guys often do a job which is very hazardous. But some of the skill sets they look for, I think, are common in places where you need people who can operate across um, branches of, of, of a business, across mm -hmm. different sectors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think, to, you know, after I've taken the scenic route on your question, I think what we come back to is that you need, you need to be educated, but I think you also need to, to go to a place and be prepared to learn. Uh, but I think the big, biggest single thing, if somebody was to say to me, how do you do procurement? I think you do procurement by paying attention. Yeah. You pay yeah. attention to what's going on in your business and what's going on in the world and what's going on in the economy. And so I want to move. Um, actually, I, I've got some questions later in the show that I want to touch on that. Um, sure. Just while we uh, kind of round out your background, you're currently with Optimum Procurement. And what I'm... Yeah. Um, Interested to know is, what's the remit of a chief knowledge officer? <laughs> Interesting question. <laughs> um, it's, it's not to know everything, that's right. for sure, because I don't. It, really, it's to, my, my role in the company is to, be, is to question things, uh, to, to look at the markets that we work in, um, and to think about uh, the issues that are going on that we can then take to our customers. So... Um, for example, an area that we're very interested in at the moment is the, the, the notion of the as-a-service economy. Yeah. Um, and as a, a, an outsourcing business, the old outsourcing mindset I don't think operates now. People don't commit to, to such great big pieces of work over a long period in the way that they may have in the past. So looking at, at, at situations like that and then being able to under, understand ourselves and understand what our product offering or service offerings will be so that we can go into organizations and say, look, we can take the headache of, out of that part of the work for you um, so that you can focus on far more strategic things, but keeping an eye and being cognizant of the fact that some of the stuff that seems simple, some of the transactional stuff, it's only an assumption we've made that this stuff isn't as important as the strategic. If you don't get that basic stuff right, you can't do the strategic stuff right. So it's it's kind of, my job is to, is a kind of balancing act. I do go out and do a lot of work in the um, advisory mm -hmm. sector. So I go out and speak to people. But I go out and speak to people about the art of the possible in their business rather than go in and tell them what I think they should do. Yeah. And I'm interested you talked about the as-a-service economy because – um, you know, that's something that I really highly believe in and have talked and, and written about. Yeah, I've just read some of your stuff. Yeah, what I'm interested in is um, what's the pace of change? You know, when you talk to people, do you see companies, a uh, light bulb go off to see what the possibilities may be? Or do you find it, it's more of a harder sell right now? I think that the hardest sell is that you're not going to come in and take people's jobs away from them. But uh, so the light bulb coming on. Sometimes people have got a fair idea of, of what we're about. Other times, um, you know, we'll use our sales deck and walk through that. And perhaps, for example, one of the things we talk about is the ACE model, which is based around understanding uh, the organization's aspirations and then looking at their capability and how that may need to be developed and looking at their um, execution and how that may need to be developed. But leaving the kind of real hard decisions to the organization. Uh, and that's because 
a part of the philosophy of Optimum is about meeting their needs and not kind of dropping something into their lap and just saying, you know, get on with it. So it's, a, it's about, there's far more understanding involved in what we're doing now. And I think it comes from trust. So whilst it still may take um, some time for a, a, a prospect to drop into a, a client, um, it's it's a learning curve for us as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's adapting to this new need and understanding the need. Yeah, and kind of understanding how to position it with companies so they understand what the opportunity may be and that it's yeah. it can be um there can be a, a heck of an ROI in doing it and it can really change the way they look at procurement but without it necessarily being a threat. Yeah, I think ironically, um what has struck me on several occasions is that it's people who don't really understand procurement that when you kind of sell them and I mean that in its kind of marketing yeah. sense generally, um, that when they when they kind of get procurement as a, by virtue of the conversation you've had with them, they're far more open to working on a, in a, a collaborative way than, say, old school procurement people who I think still have a nagging feeling that, you know, that um, the CPO's job is at threat rather than this is an opportunity for them to to. to, to operate in a different way yeah that's what i find is that a lot of people still have um kind of a the, the walls the castle walls around them yeah. um as and look at a procurement as a function that's being um, hit at from all directions and you're having to remain strong and just plug on with what you think is the right thing to do rather than maybe open eyes a little bit and think well what does the company actually want from you um, and not be afraid of change so when we talked before the show, really, and, and it's kind of playing out now, the only difficulty we had was trying to narrow down and focus, um, okay. because I think that we could talk all day on a variety of different subjects. Um, something that I was really interested in exploring on the art of procurement is a changing skill profile and behaviors, um, both for sure. leaders and for professionals, I think, especially in the times of change that we're undergoing right now. And you kind of alluded to that when talking about your role at Optimum, there's so much change going on in procurement that it's hard for for folks to figure out what that means. Yeah. Um, so something I wanted to revisit was um, there was a a white paper that you put out a few years ago talking about um, the seven habits of highly effective CPOs and procurement leaders. Yeah. Um, I think that looking at behaviors is really important. And so I'm interested to kind of go through what those seven habits were, but also think a little bit more about what's changed and how, how are things evolving and maybe how are skill sets changing? Are, are the needs of companies changing from what they want from their procurement leaders? Yeah, it was it, all, it, all interesting in itself. It's ironic because I started, uh, I started my, um, when my little spot yesterday at this event I attended by saying that uh, procurement needs to wake up from the sleep of habit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote something about the seven habits <laughs> of procurement leaders. But, uh, I mean, I, I guess what I mean is, is, is there's, there's good habits and bad habits, and there's old habits and there's new habits. But uh, the, the thing about the, the piece of work, the, the, the seven habits piece of work, I did it with jointly with a, a, a good friend of mine, um, a guy called Professor Mike Lewis, who is... Um, uh, at Bath School of Management in the West Country of the U Western part of the UK, and he, he he and I had been working in uh, with a group of procurement leaders from disparate sectors. Um, so none of whom who had kind of uh, you know there, there wasn't any sort of commercial worry involved in the right. whole thing. And what we did actually was that we did this piece of work in two parts. The first was to talk about talk with the procurement leaders. Um, over a over a two day event, and get them to drill down into the issues that that were important to them, and the things they'd like to see, and the things that were successful in their organisations. And there were more than seven habits, but there were seven things that we pulled out that we thought were pretty important. But we also had uh, a, a session with um, the CPOs, but that we invited them to bring some of their CEOs along. We interviewed the CEOs as well. And we interviewed, I think it was 13 CEOs, and of that 13, seven came along to the event. So there was a, a, a fair bit of bravery going on because right. people had to be candid. And the expectation of 
CP, uh, the CEOs went from, well, I just want them to get on with their job and I don't really know what they do, to people who really understood the intrinsic nature of, pro of procurement to the enterprise, that, that this front part of procurement, the bit that impacts uh, um, the, the sort of input of the organization before they convert it into something and then sell it, is critical. But um, there were fears as well. There were people there who, CEOs that were saying things like, you know, I don't know if they're up to the job. I don't know. And it, it was, this was back, I think, it, I can't remember when we actually did it. I think it was 2008. But it was just before the crash. Mm -hmm. And then I think the crash gave procurement a big hand up. But the, the interesting thing out of this whole thing was hearing both sides. There was a third part, but we didn't manage to finish it, which was to start to talk to other CXOs and ask them to comment on their CPO um, colleagues. But we, we, we got a few interviews done, but w with one thing and another, that, that didn't sort of pan out. But the good thing about the habits were that when we looked at them then, some of the stuff was ambitious, but people were actually doing it. Um, and interestingly, reflecting back on it now, and uh, you know, to your point about uh, what's changed, um, lots of lots of this has sort of come to fruition, but it's come to fruition ironically, um, enterprise wide rather than just in say in procurement. And people are understanding that the alignment that uh, when you say building credibility, but building a kind of notion of what your role in in the enterprise is. Um, uh, and, and this whole thing about value, which, as you, you pointed out at the beginning, was the the, the title of, uh, of my book, was about the value proposition that procurement now had that it didn't have, say, thirty years ago. And this is this. I think this was the part that was the most interesting, and that Mike Lewis and I have, in fact, talked about revisiting. One of the things you mentioned there, and actually, I had um, a couple of questions in my mind to to probe on it. So it was interesting. You said that you talked with CEOs because I didn't realize you did that. Um, it was called uh, that, that article. It, it might not it resonate so well in the US unless you took it to an ice hockey <laughs> analogy. But it was called more than the goalkeeper, right? Um, and what we did was we picked an exemplar of a goalkeeper. You'll know who he is. A guy called Peter Schmeichel, who mm -hmm. also scored outfield goals and had done this and done that and done that. He was more than a goalkeeper. He was somebody that wasn't just there for saving. And and, and that that um, uh, phrase, more than a goalkeeper, came about because a guy, one of the CEOs during the, the discussion, stood up, banged his fists on the table and said, I feel like I'm in a room full of premiership goalkeepers all they're doing is talking about saving. <laughs> I guess you could translate that to, to ice hockey yeah. and then a, a Hall of Famer uh, uh, goal minder. Um, the only guy I can think of is Guy Roy. There was a guy, wasn't there, called Guy Roy? Um, you probably know more about ice hockey than I do. Well, I don't know much about it, but he's a big <laughs> name, I know. But, you know, it's, it's, it's this going beyond saving. Yeah. In other words, you've got to become commercial. And there's, only, there's, a, there's certain things you have to do to become commercial. And did, did you find that CEOs thought that, um, on the whole, that procurement was aligned with what their vision was for the company, or that procurement that CEOs felt procurement operated in a bubble? A bit of both. A bit of both, really. Public sector. We also spoke across public and private sectors. So, as with your NIGP in the states, um, you know, you had people who were talking from public procurement about it, as well as people who were talking from private organisations. The thing that struck me more than anything about public procurement was that people had, this, instead of one sword of Damocles above their head, they had about five. You know, if, if, if local sourcing was the big issue and they were looking at something else, then, you know, the, the, what became problematic was that uh, they would be distracted from one thing and politics came into it and all sorts of stuff. But I think that the, the thing about the, the, the private sector was that the CEOs who did have a handle on procurement or maybe had even had a brush with procurement in, in previous roles did recognize procurement's um, importance in business. And ironically, I, I did a blog today, which was, you know, it's got this sort of cartoon on it about how many executives does it take to change a light bulb, you know, 
are they looking at the right things? Right. You know, did right. did the crisis of Volkswagen come about because of climate change? Did you know one could say yes, but basically there's an executive decision somewhere to say, you know, we're going to filibuster the rules yes. by yes. putting a piece of software in. So I think sometimes that businesses don't necessarily look beyond the walls of the boardroom at what makes the company tick. And I think those that are smart enough to do that are the people who are smart enough to understand how all the individual functions. Let's knock the silo walls down. What are these people, what have they got on offer that are going to help us uh, help us uh, hit our profitability aspirations? And, and what do you hear from execs that they're looking for? For, from their procurement teams today when you talk you're not just in the survey but i know that you work with optimum you're talking to cxos all the time on uh, yeah. on bringing um you know change to procurement what what do they want well it, it varies i mean I, you know some guys will say to you things like oh procurement silo is self-created um and i can understand perhaps through their frusta- frustration that they think it is but i think there's also a game that goes on where people um I mean, this is the this is why I find behave, in looking at behaviours, the procurement behaviours. Um, there's you know behavioural economics and you know behavioural procurement must be a, 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 you know there must be something in that. And it, what interests me about it is that people, the thing about humans compared, say, to automata, is that people will do things counterintuitive because they will try. You know, they 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 won't be make, basing their decision on the optimum that they'll get out of something if you'd excuse the pun, mm-hmm. but they'll be, they'll be looking rather, they, they'll be looking at it either from a rational point of view or from an emotional point of view or from a political point of view. I mean, one only has to leaf through the pages of, of, of Machiavelli's The Prince to realise that um, these are the games people play and they have done for millennia. And I think that uh, if we start to look at why and how we behave um, like we do, I think business, for one thing, has been competitive for a long time. So uh, marketing and procurement may or may not have got on. Legal and somebody else may or may not have got on. And I still hear time and again people say that procurement want to hold things up. Right. Which I think is quite an immature reaction because a a, a degree of of, of caution is important, Uh, especially when, you know, people's jobs are at stake or people's lives are at stake or, you know, You've only got to look at some of the, the corporate responsibility issues that are around today, things like child labor in other cultures and other countries. Serious decisions need to be made about this. So you can't just sort of say, oh, you're holding it up. It, 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 that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't wash with me. No, I think it depends on, um, to a large part, what the organization's perception of procurement is. Because if there's delays that are for good, well-founded reasons, you know, a company who values procurement um, and a CPO that has credibility the business understands it's for a good reason. But if you yeah. don't have that credibility, it's just seen as, well, let's just process, 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 and they're getting in my way. Yeah. Well, yeah. But then I think in some ways, uh, CXOs are certainly those, those CXOs that are close to the board need to, set, need, need to explain or express to those people that, right. you know, you know we, we've got to make the right decisions and sometimes those decisions take longer than we think. But I, I'm, not, I'm not moving away either from the fact that you know people, there are a bunch of people around you all think that procurement people have ended up there because they're not good enough to work somewhere else. Or there's all, But I just think a lot of that is um, it's almost like status anxiety. So, so how can a CPO start to build credibility then with his execs, with his CXOs, if, they, if he doesn't have that credibility today? Well, I think if he or she doesn't have that credibility, they've got to they've got to think about how do I how do I start breaking barriers down? Uh, what can I point at? What can I support my argument with? If you look at the way academics have to do it, uh, just to draw an analogy, if you an academic when they write a paragraph might cite four, five, six uh, people in it mm-hmm. to to prove what they're doing. Now, you might not have the opportunity to do that at work, but I think um, that if you go into the in it back to the the seven habits um you know if if you're building credibility just think about the other six habits that over overlap that building the credibility so having an eclectic team having different people people who aren't necessarily all procurement people working with you thinking about the next generation acting with integrity so being you know above all you've got clean hands you know those sorts of things 
and being aligned and using the language of alignment. So you're not just using, you know, procurement language and talking about RFPs and right, this and right. the other. I mean, it's talking and, and saying to people, hey, look, you know, let's just look at the landscape. You know, look at look look at what what's going on, um, and I think it's it, it's it's creating a dialogue, and yeah, there there will continue to be skeptical people. There will continue to be people who want to be antagonistic, um, but procurement people can be pretty antagonistic themselves at the time. So I think it's understanding that you're all on the same team. Uh, uh, interesting, it's the Super Bowl this weekend, and I you know. I, I can imagine that the offense and the defense and the special teams are all going to be wanting to do the same thing: win the Super Bowl. And, and you know, yeah, the team, the, the people that don't are the team that I follow, which is the Detroit Lions, who unfortunately well, lose every year. <laughs> That's the old school procurement model, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'll just sit here and say go Panthers, but you know, I mean, I think that the that the, you know, in teams and the team spirit, the team spirit that the CEO who's not necessarily the captain on the field necessarily, but the, the CEO is probably, you know, the, 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 coach, the head coach or whatever. It's bringing all those groups of expertise together. And I don't think, I, I, I'm, I'm far more convinced now than I ever have been, that it's not just the job of the CEO and just the job of procurement. There's a two-way deal here. It, there's a two-way street here, and the, 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 the action has to be on either side of it. That the, 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 the board... The, the, the top people who are driving the organization, um, they need to be working uh, to develop the understanding and the importance of the other parts. It can't just be that the salespeople are important because if the procurement people haven't done their job properly and, and, and got the stuff in that you need to make or shape to sell, then what are they going to do? Yeah, you're I mean, losing this battle. Is yeah. Uh, there was a couple of things you mentioned that I wanted to touch on. One was um, talking about value. And, you know, how, I guess value, what value is, is um, it's, a, it's not concrete. It means different things to different people and also different things to different companies, depending on whether they're um, trying to save money or whether they're in growth mode. Um, how, how can a CPO really demonstrate the value that procurement can bring and kind of um, explain the, the value prop of his function or her function? I, well, I got asked that question. I, I did some work in Kuala Lumpur with um, with Patronus, and the COO of Patronus asked me, uh, you know, looking across at their procurement team, um, with whom I did some work, you know, he, he asked me a very similar question about value, and I said, well, to me, the value of your procurement team is in the gas stations you've got around, you know, Malaysia. If people are pumping uh, Patronus fuel into their cars, they feel they're getting a good deal for the ringgits that they're spending on it. Mm -hmm. Procurement have done their job because customer satisfaction at the end of the day is what the business is all about. That's what will make it profitable. That's what will make your customers loyal and come back to you to buy your your product again. And, and I think the easiest way to look at it is to understand how procurement part is played out and understood now that's could be seen as being a a little bit kind of nebulous but ultimately if procurement does its job properly it makes the rest of the organization work smoothly because it is aligned when people ask me to define value i i, I think i like peter drucker's def or, or the economic definition value is is the amount of pleasure or satisfaction you derive from a good or service. So you don't buy a Bentley because it's a car. You buy a Bentley because it's a reflection of all the things you've done to work to be able to afford a Bentley. If you just want to buy a car, you'll buy some. You'll buy a box of four wheels that drives on air. You know. <laughs> <laughs> or if somebody wants to buy a pair of shoes, they. they you know, they, they want to buy, and this is what I think sometimes we lose sight of: is that that, that value is a satisfaction of, of uh, a want or a you know, is satisfying people's wants. And and so, a, a company that is profitable, and a, or a company that has satisfied customers, is one in which all parts of the organisation are doing their job, which satisfies the customer. And I think that there's an internal view to customers, but there's also a very, very important external view to customers, 
that maybe procurement people um, haven't fully understood or reflected on in the past. And I think that's, you know, that's quite a, an interesting um, uh, departure for me because, you know, by challenging the notion of value, if people think the only value procurement brings to the business is getting stuff cheaper, it's a zero sum game. That right. won't be, you know, it's not sustainable. Yeah, and I was talking to um, the head of sourcing of um, one of the largest consumer products companies in the world probably a month or two ago. And, and they were talking about what value meant to them. And it was that they basically enable their stakeholders to win, to win in whatever their business is, whatever it is that their targets or their goals are. It, it's, they don't look at it as we need to reduce cost or reduce margin. They just look at what's my stakeholder's goal? How can I enable that? And that really stood out to me because that's something that, I'd not thought of it in those terms before, but that's absolutely what I think we're here to do. It's not to um, chase some kind of numbers. Um, it's really to help our business be better at what it is they want to be better at. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, just, that's what, when people talk about sustainability, often their mind just gets stuck in some notion of, of protecting the environment or, or, or whatever. But it's far more, I think, these days, to do, it's sustainability of the organization. And if, if by being aligned and working well, within the business, that keeps you sustainable because mm -hmm. people will keep wanting what you have to offer. Uh, so, so getting cents off in the dollar isn't the big issue. The big issue is here is that you, 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 know, you, you are there to help maintain the organization going forward so that it can uh, you know, provide jobs, uh, you know, export goods or services, etc., etc. It's not just about, you know, people have to have an holistic view of what, their role is in a business, or even if it's government procurement, you know, in bringing about whatever it is that the the city or the state or the county or whatever it is wants. You know, if people, if you work for the, you know, procuring garbage services, well, make sure they're picking it up and they're doing right. it. Right. Right. One of the things you talked about that I wanted to come back to as well earlier was um, building an eclectic team. And uh, first of all, how is the skill set changing? How is the procurement skill set changing? Well, I think it's changed in a big way. I think in the past, people used to say, we want business people to come into procurement. A lot of people used to say, you know, if people, we want people with business degrees uh, and this, that, and the other. But I don't think business degrees necessarily give you commercial acumen. It's, you know, so the eclectic teams are having, again, if I go back to the example I you know, mentioned about people who, who, who go into special forces, yeah, they're in a force, but they need to be able. They need to be able to do more things than just shoot or just blow things up. They need. They they might need language skills. They'll need cultural skills. They'll need to understand should they be captured or working with uh, groups in another country that they they there are, there are social and cultural issues that need to be taken into account. So I think increasingly we're moving away from a hard skill set, which was easy to identify for mm -hmm. people, to understanding the soft skills. Now, the interesting thing for me about the soft skills, of course, is they're the hardest things. You know, learning another language or learning several languages isn't easy. It's difficult. You have to stick at it. Uh, being able to negotiate in a way other than, you know, the kind of old you know, old school movies where one cop bangs on the table and threatens <laughs> right. to eat you, the other one's your friend. Uh, you know, that doesn't exist anymore. It's much more about talking to people, understanding their issues, hearing their part of the story, and working through something together. Because people had, to, you know, people have long memories. Organisations have long memories, and if through a time of of difficulty, somebody decides they're not going to be very nice, when things get better, you might find you're gone. And I think that uh, increasingly those people who don't consider the supplier and the supply base and those people who don't consider their internal stakeholders are going to find themselves looking for jobs if they're not careful because it, you know, this whole thing about being collaborative, about looking for innovative ways of doing things, um, whilst people say it, it, it's a kind of a, quite a new thing, if you read Clayton Christensen's book, uh, the innovator's dilemma it's mm -hmm. not all that recent i mean it's been around for a long time and the novelty but it's persuading people about the novelty again if you go back to machiavelli one of the interesting things he points out is anybody with a new idea has enemies in those who did well under the old school 
and has lukewarm friends in those who'll do well under the new until, of course, it gets up, taken up and then everybody's your friend. Um, and it's, it's so I think that, that the new skill sets are about um, collaboration, they're about, but I think, you know, possibly the thing you want to look for in people more than anything is, um, you know, people who are, are genuinely interested in what they're doing, people who are collaborative but creative um, and, and will delve into things, people who are adaptable to change, people who are resilient to pressure. These are the things, these are the qualities that we need to look for in people. And part of them are soft skills, but more deeply now we need people, they're kind of life skills, it's a kind of maturity. And you don't have to be a grey hair to be a mature person. You, there are young people who are mature. And young people who are mature, um, it, you know, it, it's just through how their upbringing or their attitude to life or all sorts of things. And I think that increasingly, we, and it, it, I hear people say so often, well, in the organisation I work in, we just haven't got the people. Maybe you're not looking in the right direction or asking the right questions. Well, I hear a lot of people talking about the um, the so-called talent sh shortage and talent crisis yeah. in procurement. I think that a lot of that stems from the fact that there just isn't the skills that you talked about in great numbers across our profession. And so I hear more and more companies looking outside of procurement to bring those in and maybe looking at subject matter experts in a particular field. And you can then teach them the um, the harder procurement related skills. Do you, do you see that trend? Do you think that it's a... Um, a risk to our profession or um, do you think that there'll be such a need for procurement going forward that it's not a big thing people are just having to look elsewhere for the skills that they need to, to kind of cement what's already in the profession I think I think what uh, well what I would do given that problem is I would look internally first before I spent money looking externally for somebody else who might come along and appear to have the skill sets only not to have the skill sets so, I mean, if, if I can encapsulate it into three things, so core, soft, and life. Core skills are the fundamentals. They're the things about how you apply your skills. So you'd be looking there for people's knowledge, so their literacy, their numeracy, some scientific knowledge perhaps, uh, tech proficiency, commercial awareness, and uh, an understanding of cultural and civic matters, so they understand about cultural things, social mores, but they all un also understand about the law. And the soft skills, this is where I think you look at the competencies people have. You know, how do they solve problems? So you're looking at their intellect here. So you look to see if they're creative. What are they like as communicators? How collaborative are they? Are they empathetic? Can they think in a structured and critical way? Are they problem? solvers and then on the life thing you're really looking at the personality here and I think um, it, it's how people approach change is how I I look at this and so you're looking at their nature you know are they curious do they work on their own initiative mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned before are they resilient are they adaptable are they are they natural leaders and again are they socially and culturally aware because the thing is if somebody isn't a natural leader and you want them to go and do something um, where they need to go and persuade other parts of the organization or be able to speak internally and externally to people. Uh, and they're, you know, very incredibly introverted. And, well, they might not be the right person for this job, but you need a mixed team. So you need not just everybody being like that, but I, I say look across the board, look across those three things of knowledge, intellect, and nature, and look for the mix that you want and need. It's not going to necessarily be in somebody from outside, although you could go and I mean, I, I read a book a few years ago by a guy um, and it was called um, The Creative, Coming of the Creative, I've, the title's gone out of my head yeah. now, yeah. Somebody, somebody Florida, I think his name was. And what, what he was saying in this book is that people, the rise of the creative class, it was called, and what, what Richard Florida, what he was looking at he was going to places and to cities that had art schools. So he went to places like Austin, Texas, San Francisco, uh, New York City, uh, and, and places that had big creative scenes in them. I don't mean to diss any other cities by not mentioning them, right. but they're three that immediately came to mind. 
And what they started doing was recruiting people from arts backgrounds because they felt that the way they looked at things were different to the way that people from um, more scientific backgrounds were. But you need both. And creativity um, is, um, is, is something that comes from people who uh, allow themselves to think about issues and, and not to just be persuaded by one thing and say that there is a best practice or there is a fact. They, you, you need to look across subjects. You need to look across things. Uh, and there's another. There's a brilliant book by an American guy called E. O. Wilson, which is called Consilience. And Consilience talks about how science, the humanities, and the arts all come together because they're all social constructs. constructs. They're all things we've made up. And we sometimes divorce these and, and, and try and push them away from each other mm-hmm. and, and say that they're, they're separated. But, um, you know, if somebody's a painter, they need to be – there's this element of science in it because you look at perspective, you look at shape, you look at form. Those things are, those things are scientific things. They're not just, uh, just something you've made up. We, we need to look at skill sets differently. We need to look at what we want from people differently and it's not just the people we're looking at who need to be able so it's just by looking at a a bunch of people stood in the street and saying none of those will be good enough Mm -hmm. is crazy because you don't know what what's in their heads so part of the job is ours as well and and as you build that team um and you build a as you say it's kind of a you don't want a team of um necessarily folks who are all good at doing the same thing it's going to be a very mixed team with very mixed backgrounds to complement each other and work off each other as as you start to get that in place i think one of the key challenges going forward is retention and um, keeping the talent that you have giving them the opportunities they need to grow and and kind of keep them happy because the people who are, are on that team who are really able to bring value are going to have tons of options um, and can probably leave at a mo- moment's notice. So how can a leader start to think about more proactive talent retention? Because I, I see that that's never really been a big um, programmatic effort by companies. It's more if somebody who is a, a high potential, high caliber person decides to leave, then somebody will go and try and put in place a way to, to keep them rather yeah. than being a little bit more proactive. What are yeah. you seeing? Well, I think, uh, I can't remember who it was who said it, but it was somebody far more clever than me said that part of a good leader's job is to prepare their people for their next jobs. So having an accepting that good people will move around because they're attracted to the job market, I think is, is one thing. The other thing about this is that I think, you know, it's always been this way. Again, if you look at sports, I, I don't know so much in the States, but here, if, if a football player is a good football player, other clubs will want that person and will try and buy them. Right. And if you've got somebody really bright, uh, you know, a going somewhere person working for you, if things aren't very good in your organization for them, they are going to move. People will try and turn their heads. But I guess for leaders, for, for, for managers, and these other people, the way to keep people is to make where you work enjoyable. Make it be a place they want to go to because the only reason why people want to go somewhere else is because where they are at the moment isn't what they want. So again, it isn't that you know just people will come round and, and, and rustle your cattle. They'll come round, people will make offers to people and if they're satisfied with what's going on where they are, then so be it. But that's part of their value proposition. If you think of that, go back to the, the thing about value. Value is, is you know, the satisfaction of, you know, of, a good, of a want or a need. If you've got someone and they're good and, and, and you're satisfied with them and they're satisfied with you, then they'll stay. Right. So I'm coming up against time um, today. And uh, there's so many insights here to help professionals and leaders focus on being as effective as they can. Um, but I also know it's not possible to kind of neatly package it all into uh, a number of habits or into a, a 45 or a 50 minute conversation. Um, so my final question, I guess, is since you originally wrote down these seven habits and published the paper, is there anything that you've seen since that uh, warrants adding to the list or that um, should take precedent over some of the habits that you identified a few years ago? And you know, what's most important today? I think the most important one today still is being aligned and mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest the elephant in the room quite often when people are talking about 
any business is about alignment is that instead of people being aligned and all going in the, in the right direction, there's a lot, often a lot of infighting going on and finger pointing and blaming. I think that, so alignment to me is, is critical. Um, another thing I'd say, coming back to the, the, the question you just asked me, is, is thinking, clever, thinking about how to build the next generation. Who are you going to look for? Where do you look for them? How do you attract them to your organization and how do you retain them? And I think that that part of part of building the next generation is accepting the fact that people have got the right to move from place to place, and if they want to change jobs, they're just going to do it. Right. But I think going back, quite a lot of those things are coming into place. Uh, that you know, rarely being in the office was one of them. Well, people getting out and getting on the shop floor in inverted commas, getting out and talking to other people. I think that happens more having eclectic teams. But I do think. A notion about building the next generation because I think the most important thing I'm seeing at the moment is that business models are changing. And I think that as businesses need to be smaller but more agile and more elastic, you aren't going to have great big teams of people working in them anymore. You, I don't think it, we're still going to have these uh, kind of uh, organization wide procurement departments. Like when I first started work, uh, working for the Ministry of Defence. If I typed a letter, it used to get sent to another city where a typing pool would type it up, right. and then get sent back to me for corrections, and then get sent back to them, and then get sent out. Well, th there are no typing pools anymore. I mean, you, you can all see those old fifties films where there were just rows of people either at, at uh, you know, um, those calculating machines where you crank the handle, or thousands of people sitting at typewriters. That's how you know the change has come about, and I think. The change that's coming about now with, with modern technology, with the ability to be virtual. I mean, I'm talking to you in California from, you know, 11 miles north of London, <laughs> right. and it, as if we're in the same room. So I think increasingly we will adapt, we need to adapt to these changes, and it will be the millennials, I think more than anyone, who will be the people that bring about this change. And, um, and as people like me retire... Um, the new breed will come in and they'll rule. And I, I think that the whole notion of delivery models, I mean, that's enough for a show right there because I yeah. think that um, we're, we're only at the beginning stages of a, a big change in the way that organizations access services generally um, and, you know, by a, a consequence of that, how organizations access procurement talent. Yeah. And, you know, what a procurement job in inverted commas may look like today where you're working as part of a um, an in-house team um, yeah. you know as part of a, a big group and that that's going to change and I don't know if it's going to be five years ten years two years away but but soon I think if you're a subject matter expert in a certain um, niche then you'll have many many different revenue streams or income streams you'll have be working on fractional basis I talk about that for many different yeah. clients rather than just being sat in kind of one office building supporting one client and, and yeah. we're just at the beginning of that I think I think you're right I remember I, I spoke to Kelly Barner from uh buyer's meeting point yeah. just before Christmas and Kelly asked me a question about uh, I, I said I thought there was something that was analogous to this and I was talking, I, I mentioned that the TV program that was on called um, Downton Abbey you know, prior to the First World War the, those sort of stately homes had cooks and and uh, people, gardeners and chauffeurs and butlers and servants and all this sort of stuff as a consequence of the First World War, a lot of those people had been killed but didn't come back to it. Yeah. And, what, and also things became more expensive for people, et cetera, et cetera. So what started to happen was people would rent a limousine or people would get, set up a gardening business and come and pe do people's garden or they'd get cooks to come in and cook when they needed them or whatever. Quite a drastic analogy. But, I mean, if you look at it, the, the, you know, that labour where they were, people would have had a, house, a household who, who lived and worked under stairs or beneath the stairs, as they said, become, they provide an as-a-service industry. We've seen it happen before. And I think in some of the professions, I don't think the profession will go away. It'll just change how it's done. And it, this is why the whole as-a-service um, economy and, and delivery method makes sense to me because if it is massively expensive to have a big procurement team in your organization, 
then you will go to people who've already recruited smart procurement kids who can do all this stuff for you and you'll bring them in when you want them Mm -hmm. and you use the tech when you need it and then you can put it down until you need it again. And I think that that, that strikes me, rather than making a whole uh, tranche of people unemployed, it means they'll just work in a different way. So, Jared, I want to really thank you for joining me today. Um, I'd love to explore that further, but like I say, we're, um, we're coming up against an hour. So um, okay. if any listener would like to know more or contact you directly or um, check out some of your writing, where would yeah. be the best place for them to find and to contact you? Uh, the easiest way would be through LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just look up my LinkedIn profile. Um, they can. Uh, I've got a LinkedIn Pulse with about 80 pieces on it, um, all about procurement uh, and some a bit more businessy. But about procurement, and most recently the stuff I've been writing about is taking more no- the greater use of social science in understanding um, procurement and procurement behaviours. But um, oh, people could drop me an email if they like. My, um, I guess you've got my email address. Yes, so what I'll do is I'll link up to that in the show notes. Um, yes. so that uh, if anybody would like to email you directly, I'll pop it there so that when they've listened to the interview, they'll have all your contact details. Yeah, that'd be, that's fine, absolutely fine. It's been a real pleasure doing this. and uh, I hope it. Uh, I hope you got out of me what you wanted. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, like I say, I was really excited for this show and I'm struggling to kind of keep it to um, a short duration because there's so many other things that I'd love to talk to you about. Well, maybe we could talk again. Right, uh, I'd love to do that. So, um What I'll do is I will link up to um, the summary of the show along with your contact details, also um, references to books and papers that you mentioned. Um, They'll all be at artofprocurement.com slash habits. So that's artofprocurement.com slash habits. And um, if you are new to Gerard and this is your first introduction, then you're in for a treat. Gerard is you know, really prolific in his writing and just, just so much food for thought in what you write. So um, I love the material that you put out there. So anybody who, like I say, is looking for some really thought-provoking procurement-related material, definitely check out some of Gerard's writing. So with that being said, Gerard, thanks again. And um, I'm sure we'll talk again soon. That's a pleasure and I'd love to. Thanks, Gerard. Bye.